It was the year 1987. Teenage me was obsessed with one particular song, even if I couldn't make sense of the lyrics. This is way before you could ask Siri or Alexa to find the lyrics, for those of you younger ones. The song started like this. That's great, it starts with an earthquake, birds and snakes and airplanes. Lenny Bruce is not afraid. You may remember that song. The lyrics were pretty much random gibberish, quite honestly, except for the refrain that said this. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. I feel fine. Not surprisingly, even as I sang that song over and over again, my teenage mind never even considered what it might be like to actually face the end of the world as we know it. What about you? What about you? Would you feel fine if the world as you know it ended today? Would you just kind of shrug your shoulders and feel fine? What, what will the end of the world look like? What does that even mean? God's word tells us. Please open to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. It's page 849 in those black Bibles. There should be enough Bibles for everyone. I encourage you to follow along. Page 849 on those black Bibles underneath the chairs or on the chairs. So we've seen over the last several weeks that God's judgment on the hypocritical Jewish leaders and unbelieving Israel was symbolized in chapter 11 by the clearing of the temple. It was allegorized in chapter 12 by the parable of the treacherous tenants. Now it's prophesied in chapter 13 here in Jesus' teaching. So Mark chapter 12 wraps up this string of conflicts that Jesus uh, was brewing between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. Mark chapter 13 shifts gears to a private conversation between Jesus and four disciples. So this chapter is the longest section of Jesus' teaching included by Mark. This whole chapter is Jesus' teaching. And it's all about being prepared for the end of the world as we know it. So as we consider what the Bible says about the end of the world, we want to stay, as I mentioned last week, kind of on the right path of understanding God's word. We want to avoid two ditches. One ditch would be this hyper-focus on current events and how they relate to biblical prophecy and just getting all wrapped around the axle about what means what. That can take our focus off of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment to preach Christ and to love one another. Well, the ditch on the other side of this right path is ignoring what God says about the end times because it just sounds too complicated or it's, frankly, it's just plain undesirable to think about it ending as we know it. We just want it to be like this. So by God's grace, we aim to stay out of both ditches and just walk rightly on the path of understanding God's word as he in intends. We'll see some enduring biblical principles that we can choose to submit our lives to today. So may God give us grace to do that this morning. Would you pray with me as we open his word? Father, I'm reminded of Psalm 103. You know my frame. You remember that I am dust. And here I am. Here I am attempting to preach your word. Lord, would you do whatever it takes to use your word to do your work? God, I thank you that as I read your word, those will be the most important words that come out of my mouth. God, I ask that you continue to handle me rightly with your word, that I might handle it rightly for the sake of your glory in the maturity of your people, that each of us would take one step forward toward maturity in Christ, that you'd be glorified in our continued transformation. So God, work in me and work in all of us that which is pleasing in your sight as we take hold of your word and invite it to take hold of us this morning. And please come soon. Amen. So in Mark chapter 13, last week we walked through the first 13 verses where Jesus begins to describe these difficulties that his disciples can expect to encounter. And we said, don't be misled by false prophets, don't be alarmed by increasing turmoil, and don't be surprised by prolonged persecution. So this morning in our second of three messages on Mark 13, we'll walk through verses 14 through 27. So while the topics shift toward further fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and to God's power to keep his people, the message remains the same throughout all of Mark 13, and that is simply God's people must patiently endure in faith 
as he continues to fulfill his promise. God's people must continue to patiently endure in faith as he continues to fulfill his promise. So this is Mark 13. We'll read 1 through 27. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must be first, first be proclaimed to all nations. And they will bring you to trial and deliver you over. Do not be anxious beforehand what you're about to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end, will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you these things beforehand. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. This is the word of God. So the disciples' question in verse 4, when will these things be? Well, it's not addressed till verse 32, and we didn't even read that far. But what he says is no one knows except God the Father. So it's clear in chapter 13 that the Lord Jesus is emphasizing not the timing of the end, but the preparedness of the people. Not the timing of the end, but the preparedness of the people. So today we'll look closely at verses 14 through 17. Two major headers today. The first one is the abomination. And under that header we have the desolation, the despair, and the deception. And then we have the consummation. That is the consummation of Jesus' kingdom, which we'll see, which will involve the coming catastrophe, the powerful majesty, and the glorious gathering. So today's verses will swing from a detestable abomination to a glorious consummation of the eternal kingdom of God the Son, all in today's chapter. So first, the abomination. You know, probably many of us don't use the word abomination or desolation in our daily vocabulary throughout the week. So the dictionary says, an abomination is something detestable or disgusting, and a desolation means emptiness. So, so the abomination of desolation is something detestable in God's sight, that results in the scattering of God's people. Something detestable in God's sight that results in the scattering of God's people. So the abomination of desolation that the reader must understand was prophesied by, about, by Daniel about 600 years before Jesus spoke these words. God spoke through Daniel 
So chapters 9 and chapters 11 speak of a person often referred to as the Antichrist, and that way in Revelation as well, this blasphemous enemy of God who, who deceives and rallies the world into further rebellion against God. Okay, so, so when God's word speaks of the abomination of desolation, it's referring to something that's so detestable in God's sight that it causes God's people to flee. And we'll see various iterations of this. First, then the desolation, verse 14. So biblical prophecy is often uh, fulfilled in like there's a near fulfillment and then a far fulfillment. Sometimes there's a few different types of fulfillment and then there's an ultimate fulfillment in the person and work of Christ or in his second coming. So if you picture an area where, let's say you're on a road trip, you're driving out west or even southeast to some mountain ranges, and you kind of see in the distance there's different, different peaks and different distances and so on. It's kind of like driving through that where, where there's different fulfillments along the way. The staggered skyline kind of paints a picture of this idea of near and far fulfillment and then ultimate fulfillment at the end of the road in Christ. So one example we saw recently in Mark 12. Remember we looked at Jesus bringing up Psalm 110 and he's talking to the religious leaders and says, hey, God promised King David to establish his throne forever. And yet it says that it'll, David's son is David's Lord. So how does that work, guys? Jesus says that to the scribes. So his point in asking was to say that, you know, it was partially fulfilled. Of course, he had Solomon and others on his throne, but Solomon's kingship certainly didn't last forever. So then the Lord Jesus used Psalm 110 to help them see that the son of David, who's a Lord of David, has to be God in human flesh. God, who took on human flesh, he became fully man and remained fully God. So then, so then Jesus is saying, hey guys, I am the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy that God would establish the throne of David in his, through his offspring forever. So there was a near fulfillment in Solomon, and then an ultimate fulfillment would be in Christ. So as Jesus spoke here, in, in about 30, 30 some uh, A.D., the world had already seen some partial fulfillments of Daniel's prophecies. So a recent one, and uh, the, we'll say the first one, first partial fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy involved a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, some people say Antiochus Epiphanes and so on. In any case, this guy. About 400 years after Daniel. So here, he's this godless Syrian ruler in 167 B.C., he desecrated God's temple. Imagine this. He went in there and he set up a statue of Zeus, the Greek mythology god Zeus, in the altar. And prohibited any other sacrificial worship. And then, as if that wasn't enough, he took a pig. The Old Testament says they're unclean for God's people, even to touch them, let alone offer in worship. He took a pig and sacrificed it there and spread the blood everywhere, the pig's blood in the temple of God. This certainly was an abomination. So that event in 167 BC was a partial fulfillment of God's word through Daniel about this abomination of desolation. So then here's Jesus saying these words. A couple decades later, there would be another partial fulfillment when the Roman army came in and destroyed Jerusalem, completely leveling the temple. As we read earlier, not one stone left upon another. So that happened just a few decades later. So the people of Jerusalem fled, the ones who stayed were killed, leaving it desolate. So the destruction of Jerusalem and the entire temple by the Roman army was an absolute disaster. It foreshadowed the ultimate disaster that would precede Jesus' second coming. So then the destruction of the temple in 70 AD anticipated this even more disastrous day. So Revelation 13 speaks of the coming Antichrist and the terror he will cause, the disaster he'll bring to the world as we know it. So kind of skipping around here, trying to, well, I promise as we circle the plane, we'll land the runway here in, in Mark 13, land on the runway here when, as Jesus speaks of these end times. So according to Jesus' words here, look at verse 19. Verse 19. That event, that coming event, will be even worse than anything from the beginning of creation, he says. So that has to include the flood. Well, Genesis chapter 7 describes that disaster with these words. It says, The water prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, and all mankind. 
only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. So we're talking about a serious disaster, even worse than that. And yet there's a, there will be a remnant that, that uh, lives through it. So then, uh, Revelation chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 15, John 14, other places will uh, give a pretty solid case to say that God will remove his people before this time of tribulation. There's different views on this, as we talked about in Sunday school. That's not, I'm not going to sit here and make some charts and graphs and everything else. It's important and it's good to study, but the real deal in Mark 13 is be prepared. Because God's people will patiently endure in faith until he fulfills his promise. So, all that said... Uh, as I mentioned, there's honest, honorable, Jesus-loving people with different ideas about how this and other events in the end times will unfold. Jesus' point is, stay awake and endure. However it unfolds, I'm coming back. I'm going to get you. You'll be with me safely forever. That's what you need to know. So if you're in Christ by faith, that's what you need to know. And you know what? Maybe today's the day. Why not? Maybe this afternoon. Maybe before I'm done preaching. Maybe Wednesday. Maybe today's the day. If today was the day, of the end of the world as we know it, would you say, I feel fine? I'm not sure that anyone could say that. Either it would be glory and majesty and just astounding, uh, would be astounding in the presence of Jesus, or face judgment, or, or those who are outside of Christ will face judgment forever. I don't think anyone will say it's the end of the world as I know it, and I feel fine. But the true hope for every Christian is that in every trial will come an even greater deliverance. So to say that uh, God will cut short the days in verse 20 for the sake of the elect, he limits this difficult period to the length of time that he'd already determined as described in Daniel. So many will become believers during that time. So you see the phrase the elect in verses 20 and 22, the elect. Look for that phrase in your Bibles. So the basic idea here is that all human beings are born into rebellion. We're rebellious by nature, rebellious by choice, but God graciously intervenes to save some. So the Bible uses the phrase, the elect, to refer to the people whom God, for whom God has graciously intervened. So we've seen a desolation. We've seen a disaster. Know that throughout this time there will be deception. It's no secret. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew records Jesus saying, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Maybe not immediately, but ultimately you will recognize them by their fruits. Then Acts chapter 5 reflects on a couple of historical figures, a guy named Thutis, and then later a guy named Judas the Galilean. So these guys came on the scene before Jesus, and it was obvious soon enough that they were indeed false Christs. They were going to conquer Rome. And then they died, and it wasn't them. So false Christ had even come before Jesus said these words. And we know many have come after him, Jim Jones and David Koresh and all these clowns throughout the centuries. So we saw last week that false prophets are a dime a dozen throughout history, and they still are today. So I was thinking about the signs and wonders that these false prophets would perform. How does that work? Well, in Exodus, Pharaoh's deceptive magicians replicated many of the signs and wonders that Aaron did that God did through Aaron, Moses, I should say. So a person might ask, well, well then, Paul, what's our hope? What's our hope in the face of ongoing deception? If we're surrounded by this stuff, all these efforts to shipwreck our faith, what is my hope? Well, Jesus' point in saying that false Christ and false prophets will come in verse 22 is not only that God's true people must prepare to endure, but also that we can confidently endure because it's not possible for God's elect to be led astray. God's true people will endure by his grace. He is with you. He will keep you. So God's word assures us that he will keep his people to the end. Like John chapter 10, Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. Ephesians chapter 1 refers to God the Holy Spirit as the guarantee of our future inheritance in Christ. God will keep his people to the end. So we've seen these iterations of this abomination from Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 BC. Roman army coming in, this Emperor Titus with the, uh, uh, Zeus and such in 70 AD. Well, the future ultimate fulfillment of this was the Antichrist described in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. 
Then in addition to that, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that the Antichrist will exalt himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. So this abomination too will bring desolation, disaster, and deception. So that is the abomination. But after this, Jesus speaks of the consummation. This is the good part. The consummation of his glorious kingdom. Verse 24. Remember, we're looking at mountain peaks here, so you kind of see some things woven out here in the next few verses. Uh, so we have kind of short fulfillment and long fulfillment and going back and forth here. Verse 24, our Lord Jesus speaks of a time in those days after that tribulation. Notice in verse 26, he's transitioning from the immediate future to the far future by using the pronouns you and then they. So this is the coming catastrophe. See that in verse 26, you today. So all of Jesus' language here is rooted in what God has already revealed in the Old Testament. And it's important here to see how this all ties together. So chapter 2 of the writings of Joel, the prophet, speak of that day like this. The earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. Picture that. The earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. Blackness and chaos. Later in that same chapter, Joel writes, I will show, the Lord says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Well, the prophets Haggai and Zephaniah also use a lot of the similar language as precursor to these events leading up to the day of the Lord when Christ our King returns and consummates his kingdom. So I mentioned all these Old Testament references simply to say that the message Jesus is giving his disciples is not some new thing. If they knew the Old Testament scriptures, they would knew, these, knew this language, they knew these words, and they're saying, oh yeah, it's even closer now. So Jesus' words about the sun and the moon and the stars are repeated throughout the Old Testament as it anticipates the day of the Lord, the end of the world as we know it. So as far as biblical prophecies are concerned, the, the coming catastrophe that could happen any day, could happen any day, could happen this afternoon. Are you living like that? Are you thinking like that? What does that do to you when you think about that? That it might be this afternoon. Do you just want to go, no, 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 we're good. I got stuff to do. I got to fix that thing in the garage. What do you think about when you think about the end of the world as we know it? Well, the great and sure hope for every Christian is described in verse 26. Every eye will see his powerful majesty. That is to say, no one's going to need to come to you and go, hey, hey, the Christ is over here. He's right here. It's not like, hey, they're selling Girl Scout cookies at Walmart. Oh, I had no idea. I'm going to run over there and get some. That's not what's going on. Every eye will see him. Nobody will need to say, there he is. What, what, where? No, nobody will say that. Revelation chapter 1 says, every eye will see him. Now, that being said, the first coming of the Son of Man fulfilled prophecy on a relatively quiet day in a little town called Bethlehem. The second coming of the Son of Man will fulfill prophecy by being unmistakable. As I said, Revelation chapter 1 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Yet at that time, these new believers, who have endured to that point, these new believers who trust him and eagerly await his return, will be overcome with joy and relief, even as those who persistently rejected him will weep and wail in anticipation of the righteous judgment that awaits them. Folks, this is real. This is real. This isn't a video game. This isn't a TV game show. This is real. This is real. This is life and death, and this is real. So the last three chapters of Revelation is my understanding. They describe this intermediate kingdom, that is this period of time between our present situation on earth and the eternal state, where an angel will bind Satan for a thousand years so that Satan will no longer uh, be able to deceive the nations, and Jesus will visibly return, powerfully return, and reign with his people for a thousand years. So God gave his prophet Daniel a vision of the Son of Man coming with the clouds. It says, coming with the clouds of heaven, and to him was given dominion and authority and a glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom that will not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. That is a powerful display of majesty. That's a powerful display of 
of majesty. So that is preceded by this coming catastrophe and will be followed by this glorious gathering in verse 27. This glorious gathering of his people to be with him forever. He'll send out his angels to gather his elect from the four winds and the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. So again, the, the main point of Jesus' teaching here is that God's people are to live in constant expectancy and patiently endure until he returns and fulfills his promises. So we are not to scour every news article or everything online and panic. We're not to ignore and say, oh man, I don't want to think about it. I'm just, I just want to you know, get on the couch this afternoon and rest. We are to humbly seek him. We are to humbly share the great news of the gospel with others so that they might be reconciled to God by his grace forever. Again, I say this isn't a game show. All of human history is headed somewhere. Jean-Paul Sartre, if you remember that, know that name, it's a French philosopher hundreds of years ago. He said, life is an empty bubble on a sea of nothingness. Grasp that here. Really smart guy, French philosopher. Life is an empty bubble on a sea of nothingness. That's not at all how the Bible describes life. All of human history is headed somewhere. This is all moving towards something, and it's the consummation of the glorious kingdom of Christ our King. It's all headed somewhere. So this isn't a game. There's no do-overs. You know, when you're a kid, you do something dumb, you're like, oh, let me have a do-over. There's no do-overs. This is life and death. And Mark 13 wants us to feel the weight of the reality of the end of the world as we know it. So we ought to, we ought to let ourselves feel the weight of this. But there's hope. There's hope. But we need to feel that weight and recognize the reality of how, how heavy this is. Hebrews chapter 9 says that just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. To save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So what does it do to you? What does it do to you when you think of the end of the world as we know it? Are you eagerly waiting for him? Or are you going to be like the kings and great ones of the earth in Revelation 6 that say, to the mountains and the hills, fall on us for the wrath of the Lamb has come and who can stand? What does it do to you when you read Mark 13, when you think about the end of the world as we know it? I would suggest that awaiting for the return of Christ motivates true believers to surrender their lives to, to the Spirit's work by radically reorienting every area of our lives around Christ and his gospel. This isn't he who has the most toys wins. Are you radically, if you believe, are you radically reorienting every area of your life around Christ and his gospel? Jesus' words about the future are intended to impact how we live in the present. Jesus' words about the future are intended to impact how we live in the present. It all comes down to knowing God by knowing his word. So how do you, how do you respond? Does it make you sad, make you mad, make you anxious, make you excited? Whatever comes to you when you think about the end of the world as we know it, I encourage you to spend time with God. He meets you wherever you are. He'll empower you to carry on as you trust his word to do his work in you. You know that there were other prophecies that were fulfilled just a few days later. Jesus spoke often of his own suffering and death with his disciples, and he said these words just a few days before that happened. He also mentioned he'd rise again. That happened a few days after this. Let's not overlook the fact that only God himself can rightly predict the future, and he did. Jesus, our Christ, really is God, the eternal Son, sent by God, the eternal Father, to rescue his people forever. So at the end of the world as we know it, there's not one person that will merely feel fine. For unbelievers, even professing believers who persist in unrepentant sin, it will mean absolute, eternal... It will mean absolute, eternal horror in light of the sure prospect of God's wrath, his righteous judgment. That's the reality here. But for genuine believers, 
for genuine believers. The end of the world as we know it will mean the consummation of Christ, our Lord's kingdom, his eternal, glorious kingdom. We'll be with him forever. No more pain, no more sadness, no more brokenness, no more death. Our joy in him will have no end. And until then, God's people must patiently endure in faith as, we, as he continues to fulfill his promise. I have a few final words as I invite the worship team to come forward and lead us in our closing song that we celebrate. It is sweet to trust in Jesus. And as I do that, I want to say again, one, the one sure hope described in Mark's Holy Spirit-inspired writing is that the Son of God and the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all who would turn to him in faith and enter the kingdom of God. So believer, if you're a believer, know that God is with you now. God is with you to the end. You need not ever be afraid. So the unfolding of these end times events will be an affirmation of your faith in him. Even as it's chaos all around us, you can say, yes, he called this. So it's no reason to fear. God's people must patiently endure in faith as he continues to fulfill his promise to bring his people to him forever. Amen. Please stand if you're able. Let's worship.